3D software these days are capable of doing amazing things on the fly. But this wasn't always the case. Because in the early days, 3D artists struggled to do simple things that today we take for granted. From baking textures, texture painting, modeling, sculpting, and more. And I think after watching this video, you will appreciate how much progress we have made in terms of efficiency of using 3D software. So if you think 3D work is hard now, let me tell you what it was like back in the day. Before we had software such as Substance Painter and other 3D software that can bake your texture maps like it is nothing, there was something called exploded texture baking inside software such as Max, Maya, Blender, and so on. This is actually the old practice of separating or exploding a 3D model pieces away as if it was hit by a grenade, separating pieces from each other before baking maps like normals or ambient occlusion, to prevent projection errors. But modern baking tools have largely eliminated the need for this trick. Features like cage-based baking, adjustable ray distances, and mesh name matching in software such as Substance Painter allows you as an artist to bake on the assembled model without getting bleed artifacts, because with these improvements, manually exploding a model for baking is rarely necessary in current workflows. In a similar vein, 3D artists painted textures on 2D UV maps using Photoshop or similar 2D editors, but this approach has been superseded by specialized 3D painting apps, tools like Substance Painter or Mari that you as an artist use to paint directly on 3D models with physically based materials, while at the same time seeing an accurate real-time feedback. This actually changed the industry, without looking back actually because now, 2D tools such as Photoshop are mostly used for only minor touch-ups or masks, because as you know, the heavy lifting of texture painting has been pretty much replaced by Substance Painter, Mari, Armor Paint, and even other 3D software, which can paint directly in the viewport, such as Blender or ZBrush. And right now, these days, I don't think you will find an artist in the industry that would suggest learning Photoshop for texturing, simply because it has been replaced and for the simple fact that it wasn't designed to do 3D work in the first place. Did you know that before ZBrush and other similar tools became available, creating detailed characters or creatures meant laboriously modeling every polygon by hand, often using box modeling or edge-by-edge -edge construction. Artists had to manually push simple vertices to craft wrinkles, muscles, and other fine details, which was extremely time-consuming and limited the complexity they could achieve. As you may know, digital sculpting revolutionized this process, because now as an artist, you can sculpt millions of polygons dynamically, like virtual clay, and then we topologize a clean low poly mesh for animation or baking. This workflow is not only faster, but captures organic detail far better. As a result, the only approach of building high detailed hero models purely with traditional model clay has fallen out of favor. And modern 3D artists, like me and you, rarely model, say, a realistic human face entirely using polygonal modeling. Instead, they will sculpt it and use automated tools inside ZBrush, for example, or even Blender. So as you can see, traditional poly modeling is still used for base meshes and hard surface elements, but for complex organic models, it has largely been superseded by specialized sculpting tools and techniques. Can you imagine animating secondary motion by hand? because now it is inconvenient to say the least. However, in older productions, if a character's dress or cape needed to move, an animator might have to set the keys for it, or the riggers would set up dozens of manual controls for swaying and follow through. In a similar way, hair and formation was often faked with layered bone chains or not animated at all. But today, physics-based simulation has rendered those manual methods largely unnecessary. Almost all films and many video games use cloth simulation solvers to automatically calculate believable movement for things such as clothing, flags, ropes, etc. These simulations can produce natural looking results, and they can do this in a fraction of the time, responding to character motion and wind forces automatically. As you can see, the artist's role has shifted to setting up the material properties and constraints, rather than hand animating the motion itself, because simulations are now robust and accessible. So it is rare for an animator to animate things like a long coat or characters flowing hair purely by hand, because doing so would be considered an outdated approach, except perhaps in very constrained scenarios. And generally speaking, physics simulations have simply proven more efficient and honestly more convincing. 
Until recently, environment assets like rocks, terrains, trees, and so on were typically modeled and textured entirely by hand. I mean everything you can see. But now things are changing. Photogrammetry has a pendant that workflow for realistic environments. With it, real-world objects and surfaces are captured as 3D models with high-fidelity textures, providing instant realism and saving huge amounts of time. In fact, artists often debate if it even makes sense to create certain props manually when scanning is so efficient. This is especially the case for things such as VFX projects and animation, and the consensus is that scanning wins on speed and realism. Thanks to large libraries like Quixel Megascans, which has lots of quality assets, especially for making natural environments. But still, manual asset creation is needed, especially for making video games, because they need special treatment. Did you know that before advanced light and shaders, it was common to bake or paint light in details, such as shadows, highlights, ambient shading, and so on, directly into the model's diffuse texture to make it look more realistic? But in a modern physically-based rendering pipeline, this technique is usually avoided. Textures are kept free of baked lighting, and all the lighting is left to the render engine. For example, an albedo map should not contain any lighting information, I mean in the PBR workflow. But in the past, diffuse maps often had light and shadow information baked in. But now, the term albedo is used to emphasize that it is purely base color, with no lighting. And this shift means that artists no longer fake highlights or shadows into textures, and doing so would actually break realism under dynamic lighting. In the 1990s, before subdivision surface modeling was practical, many studios built organic models like characters and creatures using NURBS or patch-based modeling. They would stitch together curved surface patches to approximate complex forms, since hardware back then struggled with very dense polygon meshes. This approach was tedious and prone to visible seams between patches, but as computing power increased, the industry shifted to subdivision polygonal modeling, and later, multi-resolution sculpting with software such as ZBrush. Notably, Pixar tested and adopted subdivision services, especially in the late 90s, I would say between 1997 and 1998, when they proved that they could replace NURBS for film quality work with the advent of digital sculpting tools. An artist could directly shape high-poly models without worrying about NURBS constraints. And today, patch modeling for organic shapes has been essentially abandoned. As you can see, modern character artists either sculpt freely using software such as ZBrush or use polygonal and subdivision modeling. And these days, the old NURBS service technique survives, but only in areas such as industrial design. Did you know that in early 3D games, sometimes they animated characters without bones, by storing each frame as a separate set of vertex positions? For example, Quake 2's MD2 format used vertex keyframes. Essentially, the mesh was deformed into each pose and the game interpolated the vertex data. This technique is now rarely used, because it has major drawbacks. For example, you can't easily reuse animations on a different model, and it requires a lot of memory for detailed meshes. The modern practice is to use skeletal animation, where a character mesh is bound to an internal armature of bones, and the engine only needs to store the bone motions, such as smaller data, and can reuse the same animation on multiple characters. Given these advantages, skeletal rigs have completely replaced per vertex animation for characters in today's games and films. So as a general character animation technique, it is considered outdated, and mostly not very practical. Still with animation, while handcrafted keyframe animation is an art form that is still vital, especially for stylized content, it is no longer the default, especially for realistic human movement, because motion capture has taken over many areas that used to rely on tedious keyframing. By recording an actor's performance, studios can get lifelike motion in a fraction of the time, which it would take for an animator to recreate by hand. You see, Keyframing complex and true-to-life movements is very time-consuming, whereas mocap reduces the overall production cost by speeding up the process. It also yields nuanced motions, such as subtle shifts in weight and micro-expressions that are hard to keyframe. And for these reasons, mocap is now ubiquitous in both film VFX and game development projects. And there you have it, guys. I hope you found this trip into the history of 3D animation and modeling interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. You can also check some of our previous videos. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.